morning, everybody. How you doing? Doing well? Good. Can we stand together? So you glad?
especially, Lord, just in this time of the year, Lord, to remember the greatest gift that our Heavenly Father gave us, Jesus Christ, born in a man. Jesus, the precious one, Lord, we want to thank you as we sing this next song, Lord. It just declares the wonderful truth, Jesus, is what you need. Humbling yourself, coming, being born, born to die. Yeah. 
special time of the year this is, God. Just focus completely, fully, and totally on our Lord and Savior, precious Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Be honored and glorified in our time this morning. In your name, in the name of Jesus, and we pray and ask all of these wonderful things. And all of God's beautiful children said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Great to see you guys. Before you grab a seat, we're going to say hi to some people. Good morning. How is the church body today? Good. Glad to hear it. Now, I'm expecting great things from you. Because last week, I asked you guys how you were doing in second service, and you are a little sluggish on me. So, I'm fully guessing that you have come full circle, and uh, expectations are that we're going to hear a lot of praise the Lord, amens, and hallelujahs out of you guys, right? Amen. See? Man, you guys are on fire. I was right. Okay, so, uh, for those of you who are new and visiting the church, I know that I saw some new people today. So, um, let's, church body, let's give them a warm welcome. Let's tell them how much we love them. All right, so glad that you could join us. We pray that your time here is just a blessed one and that when you walk through those doors of South Oak Calvary Chapel, that you feel like this is a place where you can worship uh, the Lord with us. So um, please let us know if there's anything that we can do or any questions you might have. You can see the ushers with badges on and they'll be able to answer any questions you might have or pull one of us aside and we'd love to chat with you. And there's also a welcome form inside your bulletin, so please take notice of that and, uh, and use it as necessary. Now, before we continue on in an attitude of worship and in prayer and singing songs to Jesus, and we got some more Christmas carols that are coming, praise the Lord, uh, and also um, uh, a study in God's Word. Uh, oh, by the way, a study in God's Word. Anybody ever wish they could evangelize the lost better? Is there anybody? Okay, so there are a couple people. Okay, so, so today, as we take a look at this section of Scripture, I, I, I do it great, so I don't, have, I don't need this message, but... I'm just, Okay, so I'm seeing if you're paying attention, right? Okay, so you're with me. Okay, so Pastor Ron's going to be talking about evangelism. Uh, so have your, have your pens out, have your pencils out, and uh, bring out your notes for him because uh, there's a lot of practical application we're going to be able to pull out of this study. Uh, and before we get to that, there's a couple announcements that I do want to bring to your attention, and, and these each have flyers with them. So if you can pull out this pale yellow flyer titled FRC Action Alert. And what this is is... Um, there's basically, in Washington State, as well as the nation, but specifically in Washington State, there is an agenda uh, to push and institutionalize gay marriage. Uh, and the Family Research Council and others are looking into proactive ways uh, to, to you know, oppose uh, this agenda that's being um, pushed here in Washington State. Now, this flyer has information in it, and you notice also at the bottom of the flyer, there's a website that you can get more details. There's going to be an informational meeting hosted here uh, at uh, 7 o'clock p.m. on Thursday night. There's quite a few places in Washington State where these are going to be held, and this facility has been uh, offered up um, to host one of those. So, once again, check out the flyer for more details, and if that's something that you're interested in, show up here Thursday night at uh, 7 o'clock p.m. And, uh, and join with the Family Research Council there. Now, I mentioned Christmas caring a little bit earlier. How many people here have ever been Christmas caroling? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, that's good. Now, how many people here have never been Christmas caroling, but they want to Christmas carol? Okay, let's see. Now, that's what I'm talking about. Excellent. So, that's practically everybody in service that just raised their hand at one point in time. And have I the ticket for you, all of you, because we're going to be Christmas caroling at Rainier Vista Care Center at 11.30 a.m., uh, Christmas morning. So please, please come out. Uh, if, you, if you don't know where it's at, take a look at the flyer. It's the red flyer. There's directions on the back of it. If you have any questions about it, call me. Uh, Jackie's going to be leading us in worship. Yes, she said yes. We've got one. We have got a worship leader. Perfect. Thank you, Jackie. But uh, no, we're going to have a great time singing Christmas carols and just loving on people. Now, today happens to be my last day uh, at Rainier Vista teaching the Word of God and just ministering to the people. Uh, so Christmas caroling will be kind of like our encore, encore performance uh, that we have an opportunity just to shower them with love. So please join us. I'd love to be able just to love on the people with you. It's not about just singing. It's about showing them the love of Jesus. Amen? So hopefully I will see you there for that. It's just a great time. We, we basically just 
we're a giant caterpillar that goes through the hallways. There's just, we're just crowded in there and singing songs, and, and uh, it's a great time. So, okay, I've talked too much already. But last thing is the Wismus, the Wismus, not the Wismus. Let me slow down. The Women's Christmas Cookie Exchange. Yes, the Lavender Flyer. So that's Saturday, December 17th. Um, and so ladies, please be mindful about that. Just know that the ladies also are interested, but the men are interested as well. Specifically because we want to eat any cookies that uh, are not going to be given to anybody else. So let us know. We're looking forward to cookies. And I've even heard discussion amongst the men if their spouses cannot attend. We're looking for proxies that we can send on behalf of the spouses so we can get cookies in return. So we're, we're looking forward to good things from you ladies. Looking forward to it. A lot of expectations there. All right. Now cell phones. If you have a cell phone, now's a good time while I'm finishing up to silence it, turn it off. Whatever needs to be done there, airplane mode for you smartphone handlers. And then if you need to leave the service uh, at any time while Pastor Ron is delivering the word of God, we'd love to have you back in. And just to minimize distractions, it's always helpful. And I noticed there's a few seats in the last few rows. Um, if you could seat yourselves there. And any questions you have about that, the ushers are readily and willing to, uh, to be able to answer those for you. And now let's bow our heads and pray and ask the Lord... Um, just to bless our time and really speak to us and change us this morning. Father, uh, we need you this morning. We're, we're, we're discussing a subject that is near and dear to your heart. You sent your son to testify to the truth of who you are. You sent your son to die on the cross for us. And, and he evangelized the lost. He told people who he is. And Father, that's our desire as well. And he commanded us to do that in the Great Commission that we would declare the truth about Jesus Christ and how people might be rightly reconciled to you through your son. And, and Father, I joke and I say that I've got it down, but you know that's not true, Lord, and, and we laugh about it. But in reality, we need to grow in this area, Lord, and we need to see opportunities that you've placed before us and not miss them or neglect them. Uh, and we desire to evangelize the lost, Lord. We desire to tell people about you. We desire, Lord, to... Um, just to see people come into your kingdom and join the church body. Won't you just speak to us today, Lord? Give us practical aspects of how to do this, Lord, and to honor you in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Last night at Veritas, uh, I was sharing that this year I really purchased my heart with um, Christmas worship songs to really think of the words and um, as we were singing O Holy Night first service, the line that just stood out to me, the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. We live in a weary world, don't we? The people are weary. And, and maybe some of you here are weary. But praise the Lord, there's something that we have to rejoice in. Amen? That Christ our Savior is born that Jesus is Lord. These are so much more than just Christmas songs we sing one time of year. And so if we could stand together in an act of worship as we proclaim, as this song says, we proclaim his power, we proclaim that Christ is the Lord. Let's sing this together.
Oh Lord, we thank you so much for the reality of Jesus' birth, who was Lord at thy birth. We're grateful that when he left his rightful place seated at the right hand of the Father, at your right hand, that he did never quit cease being he, he never ceased being God. He was Lord at thy birth and he's Lord today. We come before you, Lord, to acknowledge that, <clears throat> to proclaim that truth. We ask, Lord, that you would just meet all of the needs that are represented here this morning. Those who are looking for work, those who are suffering ill health, O oh God. Those marriages that are struggling, O oh Lord. You're the source, John tells us, that we must abide in you, for without you we can do nothing. We thank you, Lord God, for <clears throat> the constant reassurance we have of you. We pray, Lord God, for uh, Kenny Johnson, Deanna, for Telma, Lord, as she uh, prepares to start radiation again uh, tomorrow. <laughs> Just calm her, her apprehension, O oh Lord. We pray for this client of Joanna Russ, Lord, who's in hospice and needs to know you, Lord. He's not a believer and he needs to know you. We ask that you would provide that opportunity through her or anyone else, Lord. <clears throat> We pray for those who are with child. Give them full-term pregnancies, healthy deliveries. We pray for those who are traveling for Christmas and New Year's and just pray that you would give them traveling mercies. <clears throat> we pray, Lord God, for the care center today. and Just that you'd raise somebody up to continue to take that ministry, O oh Lord. And we entrust that into your care, O oh God. We pray for all those, Lord God, who are serving so faithfully in our armed forces, defending our country, our nation. We're grateful for them. We ask, Lord, that you would especially be with those who are serving in harm's way, that you'd bring them home safely. And that, Lord, you would comfort those who are missing them, especially this time of year. We pray for our missionaries, Lord. We ask that you'd be with each of them especially Ben Spector in Croatia, Lord, as he's just uh, suffering from ill health right now. and We ask that you'd heal him, Lord. <clears throat> we know that you're able to do that. And we ask that you would, in Jesus' name. Be with our children's ministry, with the Abide Junior High group. <clears throat> Be glorified in the teaching. And just bless the teachers ministers from the mouths of those who are receiving your word. Lord, we look forward to what you have for us <clears throat> this morning because you are such a great and a glorious and a mighty God. We bring all these things to you in that name that is above every name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I want to welcome our brother Aaron Weens is back from Afghanistan. Praise <clears throat> the Lord. Um, just for security reasons, he never quite, uh, he's, he's like the phantom. <laughs> you just never know. And I get this text, random text from him last night that just says, are we not having church on Saturdays here anymore? I'm here in the parking lots empty. <clears throat> and uh, so I said, are you back? I mean, being the brilliant de deducer of life, are you back? And uh, he said, yeah, so brother, we so appreciate you. We appreciate your faithful service to the Lord. We pray for you faithfully. And uh, it's always a blessing to just see you back. And we're glad to have you here. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Let's open our Bibles, if you would, with me to the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 26. Acts, chapter 8, verse 26. If um, you need a Bible, please raise your hand. 
nice and high, and one of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. Acts chapter 8, beginning of verse 26. First of all, before we get into our study, I want to thank you all so very, very much <clears throat> for the emails that you've been uh, sending me regarding the, the all-church meeting that we had last week. Of, of course, the hot topic is, uh, as we're uh, considering and looking at <clears throat> And, and praying about some form of church membership, would that, would that help, um, help us to uh, more effectively accomplish uh, the call on our lives as a church to be his church in a, in a society where there's so much confusion about what church is? And, and that's stirred a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions. And to be honest with you, I'm really excited about that because I have never seen a church, our church, rise up and be Bereans. And search the scriptures to see if these things are so. And that's what we're called to do. And I want to thank you for your emails. And I want to encourage you to keep them coming. Keep them coming. The next phase of emails that I would love to see is just questions. Any question you have about uh, church membership. I love questions. Why? Because it forces me to get answers. It forces me to search the scriptures. It forces me to pray. It's sort forces me. So I would love to hear what kind of questions you have, what kind of apprehensions you have, whatever. You don't even need to give me your opinion about anything. Just say, I got a question about this. Well, we have to take the mark of the beast or whatever the question may be. <clears throat> I don't know. We're just gathering this information. And there's the ongoing discussion is, wouldn't it have been better until we really, really know for sure? No, I don't think it would have been personal. Because I think if we would have just said, hey, guess what? I think people would say, like Snagglepush, remember that exit stage <coughs> left. And we don't want that to happen. Well, I want to hear from you. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for those who are taking time. Man, some of them are like term papers <coughs> that you're sending me. And I like that. I really do. And um, uh, so please keep them coming. Just remember, if you don't send anything, then I'm assuming you just, you know, as the Lord leads, as the Lord directs, I really do want to hear from you. My email address is ron at southhillcalvary.org, <clears throat> and just keep them coming. And just rest assured, uh, I'm in no hurry. We're seeking the Lord to see what God wants to do. Amen? Like I told the men's breakfast yesterday, my desire is that we would filter all things, all of the things as it relates to being God's church this day and age. As we line up the scripture, that we would filter all of these things through a desire to be his church. A desire to be his bride rather than think what's best for us, what's most comfortable for me. Would be to God that those two would always parallel, that those would always <clears throat> be the same. Well, this morning we're going to look at another subject which I believe there's a lot of confusion about. And that is the subject of evangelism, the preaching of the gospel. And it is my prayer uh, that we would really take to heart the exhortation <clears throat> that the Lord is wanting to speak to us. I think there's a couple of ways that we can look at this subject of evangelism. And it was brought to mind, my mind as I've been spending a little bit of time uh, watching some debates, some discussions uh, of opposing views. How many of you have heard of the elephant room? Anybody have heard, heard of that? Okay, not a lot of people. Well, it's this, it's this discussion by uh, uh, authors like uh, David Platt and... Uh, uh, Mark Driscoll and James McDonald and Greg Laurie and there's these people and they get together James McDonald's kind of spearheaded it and they sit them at a table <clears throat> those who have opposing views and then it facilitates some discussion and they get a little bit of heated and if you're if you're opposed to a little bit of drama because there is that if you can sift through the drama and and kind of the crowd you know clapping in the back and the thumbs up and the thumbs down kind of <clears throat> little icons that are going if you can look through all that and you can just hear the heart of what these brothers are saying it's very helpful to to understand how the church at large is being influenced today because these are, are men who are pastoring churches of 10 15 20,000 people they're writing books uh, they're the ones, they're the voices of the 21st century church. And we need to, we need to, uh, to be uh, Bereans. We need to be uh, men and women who are, who, are not, who are willing to look and hear what the voice of the church and the representatives of the church are saying today. And in one of the particular uh, 
uh, discussions, <clears throat> it was this subject, building, or I'm sorry, preaching to build attendance versus preaching to build attendees. And the one who was representing preaching to build attendance, <clears throat> he was taking the position that I want my church to go out into the highways and in the byways. I want those people who are just standing on the sidelines and along parents whose children are on the soccer teams, along parents who have lost uh, children and are asking questions why. I want them to bring them to the church so that I can share the love of Christ with them and see them come to salvation. And David Platt, <clears throat> who I have a tremendous amount of uh, respect for, who is the author of the book <clears throat> Radical, he said... I want to teach the people who are sitting in the pews, who are sitting in the chairs, I want to teach the people who are standing on the lines uh, uh, of the soccer games how to be able to tell the person who just lost a child that they need Jesus Christ. Pray with them. Bring them to faith. And then bring them to the church to get equipped for the work of the ministry and for the building up of the body of Christ. To which I say, Amen. Amen. We're at a time at a church, as a church, <clears throat> where God is calling us to rise up and to be the church. We need to be the church. Amen. And too often we can just uh, look at the pastors, we can look at the leadership, and we can say, um, you know, that, that's your job, pastor. We're praying for you, we're behind you, but that's your job. And there's a big misperception about what this whole idea of evangelism is all about. I've shared this uh, story with you before, but I think it's worth repeating. There's enough new people that, that it, it's something that has stuck with me really over the past uh, uh, close to 30 years or <clears throat> 25 years. His name was Buck. Buck was a 16-year-old, a good old Baptist boy, <clears throat> and he really felt impressed upon that I need to share the gospel with absolutely everybody that I come into contact with, but he had a little bit of an unorthodox way of doing it. I was doing some uh, uh, marketing for a restaurant uh, at the time, and the restaurant had closed, and I was waiting for his parents to come and pick him up, and we were standing there, and Buck, 16 years old, standing next to a, a man in a, in, a, in a sports jacket and a tie, <clears throat> and all of a sudden, he just, we're just sitting there, standing there, and he turns to me and says, Ron, do you know without a doubt that if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven? Well, he caught me a little bit off guard, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, Buck, I do. And he said, well, that's good, because I didn't want to die with your blood on my hands. <clears throat> and I just remember thinking to myself, you know, I think Buck maybe has a terrible misunderstanding of what sharing our faith is all about. But the reality is there's a lot of people that have a misunderstanding. We've all been approached and maybe even approached people with a, a similar sort of approach. And, and it isn't because it's been, it's been, there's been any malintent in it. There's a lot of very well-intended people that have just, I believe, been misinformed on how it is that we share our faith with others. The reality is, is when you have good news, you want to share it. And depending on how good the news is, you'll share it with pretty, pretty much anyone who's willing to listen to it. Well, this morning we're going to be looking at this extremely important subject, <clears throat> one which, as I said, we can easily relegate to others who have the gift <clears throat> because we think we don't have it. We're going to be talking about evangelism. And more specifically, we're going to be talking about what does it mean to be an evangelist. Now, we all, when we hear the word evangelist, what do we do? We all think of uh, uh, Billy Graham. Or we think of Greg Laurie. We think of those who are really gifted at evangelism. However, what I believe the Lord would have us glean from our text this morning is to put away our preconceived ideas of what evangelism is and who or who isn't an evangelist and consider what the Holy Spirit has to say to us about this subject. And what we're going to find and what we need to bravely embrace is that each of us are called to evangelize. Each of us are called <clears throat> to evangelism. And in fact, each of us are called to be uh, evangelists. So let's stand together <clears throat> and let's read of this amazing account here in Acts chapter 8 of Philip as he ministers to this um, Ethiopian eunuch 
um, uh, here in Gaza. It says in verse 26, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And so he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. <clears throat> and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. <clears throat> he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And so the eunuch answered Philip and asked, and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now when they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. <clears throat> and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Lord, we ask that you put a hedge of protection around this place that we might hear clearly what the Spirit has for us. We pray that you'd give us courage to embrace what he wants to speak to us about this all-important subject of proclaiming the gospel of salvation to those who are in so desperate need of hearing it. We pray, Lord that the Holy Spirit would, uh, would quicken our hearts to the things that we need to learn this very day <clears throat> that would tr forever transform how we look at this subject that uh, so many of us have been guilty of just uh, leaving for somebody else to do, Lord. May we have the boldness to embrace what you tell us and then put it into practice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> amen. You may be seated. As Jason Strayer said, get out your note sheets or, or anything to write on <clears throat> because this morning I'm going to give you eight very practical things, eight very practical things that you can glean from our text in relation to how to become a better and more effective messengers of good, better evangelists, proclaimers of the gospel, the good news of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. But before we get into those eight things, I want to clear up some, a couple of misconceptions about evangelism. First of all, evangelism is not a spiritual gift. You'll hear people say, oh, well, they have the gift of evangelism. Uh, evangelism is not a spiritual gift in the sense uh, that we normally think of spiritual gifts. The spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Spirit that are spoken of in Romans chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Evangelism isn't listed there. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is, well then, what is an evangelist? Well, the definition of the word evangelist used in the scripture, it is a messenger of good. It is a messenger of good. It is one who proclaims good tidings. And I don't think there is one person here who would disagree with the fact that proclaiming the good news of salvation uh, through Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ, is anything but good tidings. Amen? I mean, that is the best uh, uh, news, the best proclamation that I ever heard was when somebody came to me and they shared with me the truth about Jesus Christ. Now, the thing about evangelist, <clears throat> this term evangelist, it's only used three times in the Bible. Uh, one time is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, where Paul's describing 
the various offices in the church, one of which is an evangelist. He writes in Ephesians 4, And he, Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry and the building up of the body of Christ. We see it again in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, uh, as Paul's giving his final instructions to Timothy, uh, this past, his, uh, pastor in Ephesus in many respe respects, his successor, and uh, we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, But you, Timothy, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The second and most important thing to know uh, about this, this, this issue of being an evangelist is to have, an, an under, with the understanding that it isn't a spiritual gift, is that Jesus indicated we're all supposed to do it. All of us are supposed to do it. None of us are, are off the hook. Jesus said, even though he spoke to the apostles, the implication clearly in the scriptures is that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. To proclaim the good news of the gospel to every uh, creature. Proclaiming the gospel is the way that people ultimately come uh, to become a Christian. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It also says in Romans 10 that saving faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. The third time that we see the word evangelist used in scripture is here in relation to Philip. Later in Acts chapter 21, the, the, uh, the author of the, of the book of Acts writes... Uh, Luke, he writes this, Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. What, what seven? Well, uh, we know more about Philip by understanding what uh, Acts chapter 6 said about the seven. We know that he was one of the Hellenist Jews. He was one of the Greek-speaking Jews who was selected to be a deacon, a table waiter. And it tells us in Acts chapter 6, that he was a man of good reputation, that he was a man of faith, he was a man full of wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's a snapshot of who Philip was, and it's a picture of what an evangelist does and the fact that we're all called to evangelize. So are you ready to learn those eight things of what we need to apply to our lives? Amen? How many of you are ready to do that? Okay. I'm ready. I'm ready for it. I'm excited about this uh, teaching because I'm tired of just that idea of, well, pass it. oh, Lord, help us. Next thing you know, we're going to be going door to door, and they're going to think we're Mormons. Next thing you know, they'll have us carrying briefcases or whatever. You know the things that I'm talking about. <clears throat> well, that's not going to happen, because we're going to learn that we need to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit's telling us to do. And so we see in verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road, which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, this is desert. <clears throat> the first thing we see about evangelism, about sharing our faith with others, it is, it is that it is something that the Lord initiates. It's something the Lord initiates. It is spirit-led. And we simply get the privilege, the amazing privilege, of participating with the Lord in the saving of souls. There's nothing quite like somebody who says, I need Jesus. When I'm down here in front, sometimes people will come up and I'll say, what, what, you know, how can I pray for you? And they'll say, I need Jesus. Oh, my, my, my soul just goes, hallelujah, ha. I mean, it just, oh, it's awesome. And you pray with them. And I love when you're praying with them and they add things to the prayer. It's just flowing from their hearts. And there's a lot of damage done by people who are insensitive to the directing of the Holy Spirit. And guess, and, and again, I want to tell you that these are well-intended people. They're people that have a heart to share Jesus with people. They've just been misled a little bit. Maybe some of you are that way. You've just been mis misguided, misdirected. This is going to get us on the right track to understand how do we share our faith. <clears throat> so the first thing we need to 
to, to recognize is it's, it's something that the Lord initiates. He, he doesn't need your help to do it. He initiates it and then he lets you participate in it. The second thing we see is that you have to be obedient. There's a sense of obedience to do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Look at verse 27. <clears throat> so he arose and he went. Very simple. He arose and he went. An angel of the Lord, the Lord uh, used an angel to say, Arise and go toward the south along the road. Just go towards the south. He didn't give them a whole lot more marching orders. You know, a lot of time we come in, we say, Okay, we're going to go do some evangelism. And we start loading our gospel six guns. And we pull them out. We're, we're just ready. Bam! We're ready to just blow people away. You walk up on the street. How's it going? How's your day? Bam! We're just ready for that. I mean, how many of you know what I'm talking about? They just, what? I, I just was going to ask for directions to the Tasty Freeze or something. That's what I was doing, and you let me have it. Now listen, sometimes the Lord will say, let him have it. Sometimes he says, you know, release. But a lot of times, based on our particular training, based on our particular methodology, or whatever background we have, that we go that route. And so first, we need to listen to what the Lord says. Second, we need to be obedient to do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. And sometimes the Holy Spirit tells you to do nothing. And that's sometimes the most difficult instruction of all. He arose and he went. Don't get caught up into thinking you have to be the next Billy Graham. The Lord may just want you to talk to the person. And then to listen to the person. Don't always go with your own agenda. Go with the Lord's <coughs> agenda. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he's reading Isaiah the prophet. Now the third thing we see, well, first of all, what, what has the Holy Spirit done here? The Holy Spirit is orchestrating a divine appointment. We had a discipleship or an evangelism meeting at Veritas Christian Fellowship last night. Boy, we have got some evangelists, some people that are just hungry, and they're hungry to, to help you and to teach you, and I'm learning from them. And the first thing to recognize is that the Holy Spirit's at work to create these divine appointments. And all he wants us to do is have our spiritual antenna up so we recognize one when we see one. And so the third thing we see <clears throat> is that we're to wait until it's evident that the individual is seeking spiritual truth. We need to wait till it's evident that the, the individual is seeking spiritual truth. Now understand this. Remember from Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that God has placed eternity in people's hearts. And Acts 17 tells us that he has placed us in pre-appointed times and places so that we might seek the Lord and in seeking him that we would find him. So the reality that everybody is seeking spiritual truth. And what we want to do is we want to just mind, be mindful of the evidence. Is there evidence that he's seeking it right now? Or what's the evidence and, and the direction you want us to go to bring that out? And I think one of the great mistakes we make in preaching the gospel is that we insist on preaching it where people don't want to hear it. Now I think it's important to bear in mind that sometimes after you've begun preaching it, sometimes the Lord will say, sometimes the Lord will just say, you know what, I want you to just stand on the corner and I want you to start preaching it. Now, if the Lord tells you to do that, do that. But don't do it because you're hanging around with a bunch of people that says, man, that's all you're going to do. The Lord tells you to hold the sign up, you hold the sign up. But, but do not hold the sign up if the Lord doesn't tell you to do that. Don't do it because somebody says that's just what you should do. You want to make sure that you're hearing what the Lord is telling you to do. Because I've watched, and I know many of you have watched the gospel shared when the Lord is leading, and it's an amazing thing to watch. And I've watched it happen when it wasn't spirit-led, and it's disastrous. And the end result is that uh, God is not honored in that. And so forth, you must be sensitive to the Spirit. You must be sensitive to what the Spirit is saying to you at that given time. Then the Spirit said to Philip, verse 29, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him. I love that picture of obedience. He runs to him and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? Very non-threatening question. Do you understand what you're reading? Notice the spirit didn't say, hand him a track. The spirit didn't say, take him down the Romans road. 
Spirit didn't say share the evangelism explosion outline or any of those things, primarily because he didn't have any of those things. See, those are things that we've developed over the years. And again, not that any one of those things are wrong or bad in and of themselves. Just recognize that they're tools. There's tools. And you want to have them in your tool belt. You want to have them in your arsenal so that if the Lord uh, says to do this, you do this. If he says to do that, you do that. Uh, I attended a week-long evangelism explosion um, training. Uh, it was a week-long, very intense. And to be a trainer of that methodology of evangelism, it, it was very valuable. And, and, and I actually uh, was a little hesitant to go at first because it felt so canned. You know, just memorizing this outline. And it was actually my wife, Jenny, who encouraged me. And I said, you know, what do you think of that before I went? And it was when I was an associate pastor at another church. And I was in charge of evangelism and discipleship. And, and I said, what do you think of that? It just doesn't settle right with me. And she said, I think those things are great tools to give us a framework to then be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit tells us to do. And the reality is, is that there are a lot of people, myself included, for years who understood I was saved, who appreciated that I was saved, but I could not, if placed one-on-one, -on -one, articulate my faith using the Word of God in a succinct enough manner that they would, it would create an atmosphere for them to come to salvation. And so being sensitive to the Holy Spirit is so important. Philip was sensitive to what the Holy Spirit said, and then the fifth thing we need to be bold enough to say what the Holy Spirit tells us to say. Amen? It takes boldness. It takes boldness. And we need to recognize that not everyone is going to be uh, the evangelist dream of what's happening here. I remember, I've shared with you before, <coughs> I was praying with somebody one time. I was trying to take them through the steps of the gospel. And they said, you know, can you speed things up? Because I just need Jesus in my heart right now to get some things dealt with. And it can be tempted sometimes to say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I'm only on the second spiritual law. Chill out. Man, I, I cut right to the chase, and it was awesome. It was one of the most dramatic conversions that I've ever seen. So the fifth thing is be bold enough to say what the Holy Spirit tells you to say. I believe a lot of people bail out at this point because they, they feel like they have to say something. Listen, sometimes the Lord won't have you say anything. Sometimes the Lord would just have you weep. I remember Pastor Chuck Smith talking about uh, a woman whose husband had fallen into the sin of adultery and, and he was uh, living in a garage with this woman that he was having an affair with and she called in tears, Pastor Chuck, would you go see that? Would you go see him and try to talk reason to him? And he said, well, I'll try. And he went. And when he went and he sat there and he saw this man living in this like garage converted to an apartment, <clears throat> he just began to weep. And he said, I, I can't talk to you right now. And he wept. And you know, that so moved that man. He ended up repenting and going back to his wife. So we want to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit tells us to do and then bold enough to say, Listen, getting people to talk about what is going on in them is never a problem. It's never a problem. As long as you're genuinely interested and you're not so quick to have your own agenda that you don't hear what they're saying and how, and, and you're insensitive to what the Holy Spirit wants you to say. A lot of time that, that happens when, again, you load your, your, your gospel six guns, you've got them by your side, you're ready, you're walking up, you're already thinking what they say. You say, you know, how's your day going? What do you think about the matters? Do you know you need Jesus? I mean, you're just so quick. The least little thing, you just react. You just jump at it. Don't do that. You're going with the intent. You pray beforehand. Lord, will you, maybe you're walking up to somebody on the street. Lord, will you just speak to my heart right now? Lord, speak to my heart. What do you want me to say? Do you want me to say anything to this individual? And the Lord will be faithful to do that. Listen, people are eager to share what's on their heart. Um, I had uh, James chapter 3 shared in the light of, of evangelism to me in a way I'd never heard it, and I thought it was so cool. And that is, they said the tongue, it tells us in James chapter 3, it's unbridled, and people will talk. All you have to do is be willing to wait. Isn't that true? People will talk. We had a, a barista where we went into a coffee shop the other day, and they were telling, you wouldn't have believed some of the things that people say to me. And it's because people are looking <clears throat> to talk. 
Philip was obedient. He's sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And then he's bold enough to ask, do you understand what you're reading? I mean, think if he hadn't, if, if he hadn't caught what the Spirit was saying to him. If the Spirit said, I want you to ask him if he understands what he's reading. And if he'd have said, well, you know, that, that, that doesn't fit into my little plan here. I appreciate your attempt to know that he said just what he said. And so he asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I, verse 31, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. The sixth thing, listen to what the person says and respond accordingly. Listen to what the person says and respond accordingly. Sometimes the response may be as clear as what we see here. Other times it may be, get out of my face. They might be angry. If the response is not so positive, it's all the more important that you know how the Holy Spirit is telling you to respond to the negative response. Otherwise, you're going to end up misrepresenting the Lord, and God knows there's enough of that that's going on. Amen? You want to be able to represent the Lord. If they say, you know what, just get out of my face. I've heard, a, I've heard you know, if I had a dollar for every time crackpots like you approached me, I'd be rich. Man, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean to make you angry. Obviously, you've been hurt by that. I mean, sometimes, you know, what is the, uh, the, the Bible says that, that, a, that a, a word aptly spoken is like, fitly spoken is like uh, apples of gold in a setting of silver. And sometimes you can say, you know, man, I, I did not mean any harm. And you say, oh, man, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was such a jerk. I mean, next thing you know, they're apologizing to you. Hey, you know, it's cool. It's cool. And then they'll, they'll start opening up. So you want to listen to what the person says. If you don't listen, you might end up misrepresenting the Lord. In this case, the Ethiopian invites Philip to explain things further to him. Truly, anyone... Uh, anyone's dream evangelism experience. And I'm convinced, personally, I'm convinced that there are literally thousands of people like this who are waiting just to hear the truth. But too many times we never hang out with them long enough to know what truth they're wanting to hear, to include what their experience has already been. That is very important, people. It's very important to, to hear what their, what their experience has already been. You'll hear people say, you know what? People like you are nothing but hypocrites. And to just say, you know what? You're right, there are a lot of hypocrites in the church today. It's just like all the other stinking religions out there. You know what? Did you know Jesus uh, hated organized religion as well? And then you just, you, you just diffuse their anger. Why? Because you're listening to what they're saying. You're going deeper than um, what it appears to be on the surface. And listen, sometimes, let me encourage you, sometimes, and I've been really guilty of this over the years, and, and I'm, I'm putting that pressure aside now, and that is a lot of times we feel pressure that somehow we have to fit the gospel message into everything that we say. We have to somehow get in there, do you want to give your life to Jesus Christ? You say, you know, it can be with a... a I remember there was this guy that I knew at the, our first trip to Israel. Do you remember him, Jim? And he'd come up and he'd go, Jesus loves you. Do you remember him? And everybody he saw, everybody at the gas station, Jesus loves you. Did you know Jesus loves you? And there was this, like, amazing anointing on this guy when he said that because you were compelled. He would say that and you'd go, wow, yeah, I knew. I know Jesus... And, and so I thought, you know what, I'm, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try that. <laughs> so I went to Krispy Kreme uh, one day, and I was ordering some donuts. This was way back when the church was getting started, and I was bringing some donuts here, and I thought, you know, I'm going to be bold. And uh, he says, how are you doing? And I said, you know, Jesus loves you. And he said, are you an idiot? What? It was like, he, he looked at me like I was on some drug or something. He, he, there, there was zero connection with him. Why? Because I was trying to duplicate something that obviously he had told this one brother to do. And a lot of times we do that. We're programmed to do that sort of thing. And so we're attending this, this Christmas program um, the other day at a Christian school. And it was a, a really cool musical that was talking about the birth of Jesus and uh, the principal gets up and just shares, you know, we want to thank everybody for 
just the wonderful <coughs> Christmas play that we had and, and sandwiched right in between the announcement about uh, the bake sale and buying some Christmas goodies in a matter of 45 seconds, maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half, they share, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity to, to, to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that, do that. And then right on to the next announcement. Now again, I don't fault that principle at all. I fault a system that conditions us into thinking that somehow that's what we have to do. And there's times when you do that, but listen, I believe with my whole heart that if we try to force that when the Holy Spirit is telling us not to force it, all we do is we get marked off. There's another one of those people. <laughs> because how on earth can you capture the magnitude of God becoming man to die on the cross, to wash away the sins of the world, the one who conquered death, that whosoever believes in him would never perish, but have everlasting life. How do you capture that in a can of, a, a tin of, of fish mints? I mean, I, I, somebody gave me, just out of the kindness of their heart, or whatever, they gave me uh, these little fish-shaped mints, Christian fish mints, it's basically like they're, where they're cinnamon. And I still have it, and it fits my Bluetooth perfectly in it. But you open it up, and there's a little sinner's prayer in there <clears throat> as you open it up. So I'm going to stop right there because my wife knows that I might get a little cynical here. But my point is this. <laughs> my point is this. We have to be careful. Now, uh, do I believe that God can use a little can of fish mints to bring somebody to Christ? You know what? I believe that he can. He used a whale to... to to, I, mean, I mean, a fish that he prepared to get Jonah to Nineveh. He used a donkey to deal with, with Balaam. He can use anything. But church, what we do is we default to things like that. Oh, cool, that gets me off the hook. I'll buy a hundred cases of those things, pass them out, and then I'll be doing, fulfilling my role as an evangelist. Well, I don't think it works that way. There are great challenges that we face in genuine evangelism today, and I believe that much of it comes from man's involvement trying to help God out. It's much easier to just default to a methodology <clears throat> than learn how to be sensitive to what the Spirit is telling us to do. And I'm speaking to myself there. I had all of our pastors, <clears throat> we attended this, this uh, um, workshop on, on evangelism by Tim Delina at the conference in Brooklyn. And he immediately run my credibility when he told me he's a Caucasian guy pastored at an inner city church in Detroit, in Detroit for 30 years. He had just come on staff at Brooklyn Tabernacle. <clears throat> and he told us that in those 30 years, he tried everything you can think of, conventional and not so conventional, to, to evangelize the city. Billboards, <coughs> concerts, street witnessing, passing out tracts, you name it, he, he had done it. And he talked about what seeped into the church today is an emphasis on lightning rather than light. Lightning uh, being, being the show. And he said, he said, you know, the thing with lightning, is, it's very exciting. And the thing with light is it can be very boring. But he said, you can't read by lightning. <clears throat> I mean, imagine trying to read by lightning. You sit down and said, okay. Oh, it's dark again. Man, you'd get about through six words in a lightning storm. <clears throat> or imagine, he said, he said, you can't eat dinner by lightning. Imagine a dark room and, and a little nice candlelit dinner and, and everything. You see it by light, but try eating by lightning. And you, where's the plate? and you stick yourself in the, in the face with the fork. <clears throat> you can't do it by lightning. And no wonder evangelism by lightning, by shows, let's just pack them in, let's make it easy for them to get saved. No wonder it's not working. In other words, there's a lot of flash, there's a lot of entertainment today in an attempt to win the loss. But is it really winning souls? See, I think the church needs to be more interested in a transformed heart than a raised hand. 
It doesn't mean that a person can't acknowledge a need for Jesus Christ for a raised hand, but sometimes we're just so quick. I just want to see, I don't know about you, but I know in me that when I got saved, I was a new creation, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Oh, I had some things that I had to get worked out, but I knew I was a new creation and I've never gone back. But there's a lot of people out there, they say, and I've talked to them and you've talked to them. And you say, when did you become a Christian? They say, well, I, I raised my hand <coughs> at such and such. Well, tell me what it means to your relationship with Christ. Well, and they can't articulate it. And then they wonder why their lives are falling apart because I, I don't want to trust a quick raised hand or bow of the head. I, I want to see a transformed life. I want to pray with them to receive Christ. He believes that evangelism is moving from show to relationship, that building the kingdom is more agriculture than technology. Agriculture, you, you water, you fertilize, you water, you nurture, and then you reap. He shared how he spent 14 years developing a relationship <clears throat> with his dry cleaner who came to his last service and got saved. He wouldn't come to his church, but he figured after 14 years of business, the least I can do is go to the guy's church. And he got saved. And he exhorted us in something to think about, that the Bible verse America is no longer John 3.16 because it's everywhere you go. Because everybody's holding up signs. And it's a powerful uh, a verse, but it's, it's kind of been lessened in the overuse of it. And he said he believes that the, that the verse for America today is Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God. And that you take people through understanding. He challenged us, don't hold on to the method and forget the message. And he believes we're living in an age of apologetics, learning how to defend our faith. And if we're not careful, we can go years without learning how to effectively share our faith. He told us where D.L. Moody said once, I've won more men to Christ in holy meetings than in all my preaching. You see, sometimes we lose sight of that one-on-one, -on -one, that opportunity. Lord, how do you want us to minister to our neighbor? How do you want me to minister to a co worker. I remember when I was working at Safeco one time and the, the woman um, in the cubicle next to me, <clears throat> she was, and of course, for any of you who have been in that world, you know how politically correct it is and there's certain no-nos. And, uh, and her little grandchild had died. I knew she was hurting. And I couldn't stand it. And I said, you know what, forget the political correct stuff. I'm going in and I'm going to pray with that woman. And I walked in and I got down on my knee and I looked at her and I put my hand on her shoulder, another no-no. And I, and I said, I'm so sorry you're hurting. I'm going to be praying for you. If there's anything I can do, God is going to cover those kinds of things. Tim challenged us to look at people. He said, look at them. He said, they're sad. Isn't that what Jesus said? When he saw the multitudes, he saw that they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. There are a lot of people today and they're sad. You can see it on their faces. You can see it at the cash register. You can see it at the bus stop. You can see it all over. What's wrong with going up and, and saying, is there anything I can do? You just look sad. Again, James chapter 3, they'll open up. They'll start sharing. Then you just pray on your breath, oh Lord, give me the words to say to this individual that's hurting right now. Seventh, make sure you know how and use the Word of God. Make sure you know how and use the Word of God. Look at verse 32. The place in the scripture which he read was this. <clears throat> he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now listen, long before you get to this point with someone, the Holy Spirit has worked it out for you to have that meeting in the first place. He's worked it out for this man to be saved. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Jesus made it very clear about that as he was telling us about the Holy Spirit. Again, D.L. Moody said this, quote, there is no better evangelist in the world than the Holy Spirit, end quote. So we better learn to be sensitive to what he's telling us to do, amen? 
What is he telling us to do? You see, we cannot expect to effectively lead people to faith in Jesus Christ. This was my problem my first 14 years as a Christian. You can't expect to effectively lead people to faith in Jesus Christ if you don't know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ and where to find it. And what did Philip do? It says that he started from this spot in Isaiah and he preached Jesus to them using the word. And I believe that there are many of us in this room or, or certainly a portion of us in this room who were like me early on where we know we're saved, we know why we're saved, but if you put us in a room with somebody who doesn't know, we can't take them to the scriptures to help them understand it from the scriptures and let the word of God do the work. I was one of those people for the first 15 years of my life as a Christian. I just couldn't articulate it to an unbeliever without stumbling over myself. I, I remember those days very clearly. I couldn't take them to in the beginning God. And then take them through. Listen, when you can take them through the word of God, when you can instruct people why they need Jesus through the word of God, let me tell you what's happening. The Holy Spirit in power is moving on their hearts. Drawing them to salvation. Isaiah said that the word of God will not go forth without accomplishing the purpose for which it was sent. So even if they shut you down, they're sleeping that night, and the Holy Spirit's pounding on their hearts, bringing them to that conviction. The place he was reading was Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. But I'm certain he would have taken him to Isaiah 7. Now, he wouldn't have taken him to Isaiah 7, but he would have said, let's, roll, let's unroll the scroll a little more because <clears throat> they didn't have all those verses. And I'm sure he would have found the place that said this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. I'm sure he would have rolled it a little further to Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Just listen to what Philip would have explained to him from Isaiah chapter 53 alone. I would encourage you to read those amazing 12 verses on your own. The entire chapter speaks of Jesus. Let me summarize that quickly. Listen to what he would have read. <clears throat> there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised and we did not esteem him. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased God to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. He poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's Isaiah 53. Just, that's Isaiah 53. I mean, we could take Isaiah 53, those 12 verses, and just meditate on those. We could look at, 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 at Genesis 1. We could look at just a couple, and we'd have everything we need to be able to use the scriptures to bring them to salvation. You see, we need to know where to find Jesus in the Word of God, both the Old and the New Testaments. And then finally, number eight. We need to be prepared to see that they are properly discipled with sound biblical teaching. Look at verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? 
No doubt the Ethiopian was familiar with baptism. It's likely that Philip has addre had addressed it as he was explaining Jesus to him, but nonetheless, Philip makes it clear that he must not be baptized unless there's genuine conversion. Philip said, if you believe with your heart, the Ethiopian eunuch says, is there any reason I understand you explain to me this baptism thing? I know about John's baptism. I've been seeking these kinds of things out. Is there any reason why I can't be baptized right now? And, and, uh, and what does Philip says? He says, yeah, there's one reason. You haven't been born again. You haven't committed your life to Jesus. And so he said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. You may be baptized if you believe with all your heart. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. Now, what stood out to me about that is they were moving. I mean, can you imagine trying to stand, in, you're in a chariot, and, so, and you're just talking. They must have been moving because he said, stop the chariot right now. Because there's a body of water there. And when they came up out of the water, verse 39, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because he'd been born again. Because his sins had been washed away. But Philip was found at Azotus and passing through, what did he do? He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Church, one of the great challenges in evangelism today is that everybody has heard some form of the gospel. It may be a, a warped form. It may be an unhealthy, but they've heard some form of the gospel. And in many cases, perhaps we could even say most of it is not an accurate representation of the true gospel. And that's before we go out this week, and I'm trusting and praying that we will go out this week and begin to be proclaimers of good tidings that will take to heart these eight things. Let me review them just quickly. Number one, it's something that the Lord initiates. It's the Holy Spirit who leads it. Number two, be obedient to what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Number three, look for the evidence that the person is seeking spiritual truth Number four, be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Number five, be bold enough to say what the Holy Spirit wants you to say. Number six, listen to what the person says and then respond accordingly. Number seven, make sure you know how and use the Word of God. And number eight, be prepared to see that the person is biblically discipled. I cannot begin to tell you how important it is that we embrace God's call on each of us, on His church, to be effective proclaimers of the gospel, especially in the day when there is so much confusion over evangelism. The effective, spirit-led proclamation of the gospel, that's what people need to hear. If we can learn how to cooperate with what the Spirit of God is wanting to do and quit being a hindrance to what the Spirit of God wants to do, we're going to start seeing people come to faith in Christ. Amen? Amen? Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent as it is written by the prophet Isaiah? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's no, nothing more beautiful than the feet of one who is bringing the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. Oh, listen, they may not like it when you come. Oh, here it come. They might go around the other side. Maybe I can avoid them this time. But the hound of heaven's after them, wanting to reveal that truth to them. And you just tell yourself, you know, when they turn you, when they, when they say, you know, get out of my face, I'm not interested, just remember, you know what? You've got the beautiful feet of one who brings the glad tidings of salvation through Jesus Christ. And I think it's appropriate that as we conclude our time that we partake of communion. I think it's appropriate because what is communion about? It's about acknowledging in the bread the body of Christ. It's about acknowledging in the cup the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, because it's His body 
hanging on the cross. It's his blood shed from the cross that washes away our sin. And Jesus was intentional that his, his apostles, his disciples, and then us over the centuries would take that and remember what Jesus did for us because we won't, we won't be effective proclaimers of the gospel if we go to methodology and we forget what Jesus did for us. In fact, might I encourage you that this week, every morning when you get up, as you're praying for those divine appointments, that you would just say, Lord, would you just, just spend a few minutes reflecting on what Jesus did for you? Because the more crazy you are about what Jesus did for us, the more likely you are, you, you are going to be to share it with somebody else. So as the worship team comes up and as we have the opportunity to just lift our hearts, let's just take these last minutes to lift our hearts before the Lord. And as the emblems are being distributed, I want you to be, if, when, that, when that plate passes and that, that, that bread is there and you're picking it up, I want you to just imagine, wow, this is a representation of the body of Jesus Christ on the cross. And then when the, when the cup comes by, you take that cup and you say, this is a representation of Jesus' shed blood. And you hold on to those emblems as you're singing the words of this song that declares that we've been forgiven. Do you realize you've been forgiven? Do you realize what it means that you've been forgiven of your sin? Some of you may say, well, Pastor, I don't realize that because I've never received the forgiveness. We'll make today the day you receive forgiveness. The Bible tells us that today is the day of your salvation. And all you have to do is simply declare, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the one who came to die for the sin of the world. I believe he's the son of the living God. And it is only through him that we can receive the forgiveness of sin. I believe that his resurrection from the dead is a visible sign that he conquered death. I repent. I turn away from my way of living life. And I surrender to your lordship. You may say, well, pastor, I... I'm too wicked and ugly to be able to do that. No, that's why you need to do that, because you're wicked and ugly. It's like I was. That's why I needed to do it. That's why so many of you did it. I like thinking about that, because it reminds me that if you can do that for me, you can do that for anybody. Amen? So just hold on to the emblems as they're distributed as we sing this song, and then we'll partake together. <clears throat>
one of the ways that we honor the Lord is by telling other people of the Lord. You know, sometimes it's hard to reconcile the words in Scripture. We were praying this morning before first service, and one of our elders, Ed Williams, he was just sharing that, that when the Lord really spoke to his heart about the importance of sharing the gospel, <clears throat> it was the Lord reminding him that he need not be ashamed. And I said, oh, you mean Romans, where Romans 1, where it says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and the salvation. And he said, yes, but... It was the part where the Lord says that if you confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And in essence, what the Lord says in that, if you're ashamed to tell others about me, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you confess me before others, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And he, instantly it struck a chord in my heart. It struck a chord in my heart because I realized, oh Lord, that is the seriousness of it. And you see, the only way that we're going to be unashamed to do that is if we take times like this to remember what Jesus did for us. The only way that we're going to be able to do that is if we put aside all of our fears, all of our concerns, and Lord, would you just draw me to a place where I'm so in love with you, where I'm so confident in you, that it naturally flows from who I am, that it naturally flows from my mouth. Listen, if we rely on our own strength to share the gospel, listen, we won't do it. But if we rely on his strength, he'll provide a way. He'll provide a way and an opportunity for us to share our faith. He said, as often as you take the bread and you eat of it, I want you to do it in remembrance of my body on the cross as a lamb to the slaughter who uttered not a word for the sin of the world. Let's partake. He took the cup and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is the cup of my blood, the new and the everlasting, the eternal covenant. He said, every time you partake of this cup, I want you to be reminded of my shed blood that washed your sins as white as snow. I want you to be reminded that every time the enemy comes in to condemn you, I want you to be reminded of what I said to Paul as he wrote in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He said the blood of Jesus Christ washed away our sins by faith and gave us a right standing before a holy God. I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, that when that settles in the depths of our hearts, we're going to be compelled to start telling others about it. We need to pray that he'll move on our hearts in such a way. As we partake of the cup, let's be mindful of his precious blood that washed our sins as white as snow. Let's drink together. Let's stand together. <clears throat> and if you'll just bear with me just a few more minutes here, just remember... Just remember that we make it really clear when you're dismissed and that you're not until you officially are. And the reason that we say that is because we want to leave time for people to be prayed for. We're mindful of the clock, but we don't want to be restricted by the clock. And remember our renewed desire to be willing to come for prayer. And there may be some of you that just feel like, you know, Pastor, I've been weak in my faith. I've had a, just an intellectual understanding instead of a heartfelt understanding, and I want to be more bold in proclaiming the gospel. Or, Pastor, I'd love to be able to share my faith more boldly, but the reality is I've got things going on in my life that I'm so heavy-hearted about it that I'm even having a tough time trusting God. 
Or maybe there's something totally unrelated related that's a distraction from God using you the way he wants to use you. Maybe you don't know Christ and you want to receive him. I don't know what's going on, but I know the Holy Spirit's working on your heart because that's what he promises to do. And I'm going to step down here as we conclude with this final uh, choruses. And I just want to invite you as the Spirit leads to come up so that we can pray. We've got plenty of people to pray with you. And I want to invite you to come forward and let us pray with you. And then Pastor Jason, he'll dismiss you, but listen carefully that even after he dismisses you, he's going to continue to play. Because you may want to just sit for just a few more minutes and just let the Lord minister to you. You may want to just say, Lord, uh, would you give me the courage to go forward? I'm tired of this conviction I feel week after week after week and I don't do anything about it. Whatever the case may be, we want to give you the opportunity to come forward for prayer. And, and those of you who may just, you know, you're, you, you, you don't need to come up or whatever the case may be, then you're, you're free to just uh, leave quietly and, and, and grab your kids. And um, we'll make it clear when you're, when you're free to go. The intent is not to manipulate you. It's not to coerce you. It's not to corral you. But it's just to recognize as a church body we need a spirit to move in our hearts and we need to bear one another's burdens through prayer. Amen. And so let's do that together. Jesus, you endure my pain. Savior, you are all my shame, all because of your love. All because of your love. Maker of the
Father, we thank you and praise you for the reminder of taking communion, Lord, your body that was broken for us, and your blood that was shed to wash us white as snow, Lord. May we go about our day, Father, and our week, not only remembering and thinking on that, Lord, but just being grateful thankful for our lives being changed through you, Jesus Christ. Bless our week, Lord. Continue um, to speak into our hearts.